continuing where I left off, the first of the tall trees was reached, and by the bearings proved the wrong one. So with the second. The third rose nearly two hundred feet into the air above a clump of underwood, a giant of a vegetable with a red column as big as a cottage, and a wide shadow around in which a company could have maneuvered. It was conspicuous far to see both on the east and west, and might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. But it was not its size that now impressed my companions. It was the knowledge that 700,000 pounds in gold lay somewhere buried below its spreading shadow. The thought of the money, as they drew nearer, swallowed up their previous terrors. Their eyes burned in their heads, their feet grew speedier and lighter, their whole soul was found up in that fortune, that whole lifetime of, of extravagance and pleasure that laid waiting there for each of them. Silver hobbled, grunting on his crutch, his nostrils stood out and quiver. He cursed like a madman when the fly settled on his hot and shiny continents. He plucked furiously at the line that held me to him, and from time to time turned his eyes upon me with a deadly look. Certainly he took no pains to hide his thoughts, and certainly I read them like print. In the immediate nearness of the gold, all else had been forgotten. His promise and the doctor's warning were both things of the past, and I could not doubt that he had hoped to seize upon the treasure, find and bore the Hispaniola under cover of night cut every honest throat about the island, and sail away as he had had at first intended, laden with crimes and riches. Shaken as I was with these alarms, it was hard for me to keep up with the rapid pace of the treasure hunters. Now and again I stumbled, and it was then that Silver plucked so roughly at the rope and launched at me his murderous glances. Dick, who had dropped behind us now, brought up the rear, was babbling to himself both prayers and curses at his fever kept rising. This also added to my wretchedness, and to crown all, I was haunted by the thought of the tragedy that had once been acted on that plateau, when that ungodly buccaneer with the blue face, he who died at Savannah, singing and shouting for drink, had there, with his own hand, cut down his six accomplices. This grove that was now so peaceful must then have rung with cries, I thought, and even with the thought I could believe I heard it ringing still. We were now at the margin of the thicket. Huzza, mates, all together, shouted Mary, and the foremost broke into a run. And suddenly, not ten yards farther, we beheld them stop. A low cry arose. Silver doubled his pace, digging away, with the foot of his crutch like one possessed, and the next moment he and I had come also to a dead halt. Before us was a great excavation, not very recent, for the sides had fallen in and the grass had sprouted on the bottom, in this where the shaft of a pick broken in two and the boards of several packing cases strewn around. On one of these boards I saw, branded with a hot iron, the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. All was cleared to probation. The cash had been found and rifled. The 700,000 pounds were gone. Chapter 33, The Fall of a Chieftain. There was never was such an overturn in this world. Each of these six men was that though he had been struck, but with silver the blow passed almost instantly. Every thought of his soul had been set full stretch like a racer on that money. Well was brought up in a single second, dead, and he kept his head, found his temper, and changed his plan before the others had time, had had time to realize the disappointment. Jim, he whispered, take that and stand by for trouble and he passed me a double barrel pistol. At the same time, he began quietly moving northward, and in a few steps had put the hollow between us two and the other five. Then he looked at me and nodded as much as to say, 
Here is a narrow corner, as indeed I thought it was. His looks were not quite friendly, and I was so revolted at these constant changes that I could not forbear sw whispering. So you've changed sides again. There was no time left for him to answer in. The buccaneers, with oaths and cries, began to leap one after another into the pit and to dig with their fingers, throwing the boards aside as they did so. Morgan found the piece of gold. He held it up with a perfect spot of oaths. It was a two-guinea piece, and it went from hand to hand among them for a quarter of a minute. Two guineas, roared Mary, shaking it at silver. That's your seven hundred thousand pounds, is it? You're the man for bargains, ain't you? You're him that never bungled nothing. You wooden-headed lubber. Dig away, boy, said Silver with the coolest insolence. You'll find some pig nuts, I'm sh and I shouldn't wonder. Pig nuts, repeated Mary in a scream. Mates, do you hear that? I'll tell you now. That man there knew it all along. Look in the face of him, and you'll see it, it wrote there. Ah, Mary, remarked Silver, standing for captain again. You're a pushy lad, to be sure. But this time, everyone was entirely in Mary's favor. They began to scramble out of the ex excavation, darting furiously glances behind them. One thing I observed, which looked well for us, they all got up upon the opposite side from Silver. Well, there we stood, two on one side, five on the other, the pit between us, and nobody screwed up high enough to offer the first blow. Silver never moved. He watched them, very upright on his crutch, and looked as cool as ever I saw him. He was brave, and no mistake. At last, Mary seemed to think a speech might help matters. Mates, says he, there's two of them alone there. One's the old cripple that bought us all here and blundered us down to this. The other's that cub that I mean to have the heart of. Now, mates, he was raising his arm and his voice, and plainly meant to lead a charge. But just then, crack, 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 three muskets got shots flashed out of the thicket. Mary tumbled head foremost into the excavation. The man with the bandage spun around like a teetotum and fell all his length upon his side where he lay dead but still twitching. And the other three turned and ran for it with all their might. Before you could wink, Long John had fired two barrels of a pistol into the struggling Mary, and as the man rolled up his eyes at him in the last agony, George, said he, I reckon I settled you. At the same moment, the doctor, Gray, and Ben Gunn joined us with smoking muskets from among the nutmeg trees. Forward, cried the doctor. Double quick, my lads. We, mustn't, we must head him off the boats. And we set off at a great pace, sometimes plunging through the bushes to the chest. I tell you, but Silver was anxious to keep up with us. The work that man went through, leaping on his crutch till the muscles of his chest were fit to burst, was work no sound man ever equaled, and so thinks the doctor. As it was, he was already thirty yards behind us and on the verge of strangling when we reached the brow of the slope. Doctor, he, he held, see there, no hurry. Sure enough, there was no hurry. In a more open part of the plateau, we could see the three survivors still running in the same direction as they had started, right for Mizzen Mass Hill. We were already between them and the boats. And so we four sat down to breathe while Long John, mopping his face, came slowly up with us. Thank ye, Lee, kindly doctor, says he. You came in about the nick, I guess, for me and Hawkins. And so it's you, Ben Gunn, he added. Well, you're a nice one, to be sure. I'm Ben Gunn, I am, replied the maroon, wriggling like an eel in his embarrassment. And, he added after a long pause, how do, Mr. Silver? Pretty well, I think he, says you. Ben, Ben, murmured Silver, to think as you've done me. The doctor sent back Gray for one of the pickaxes deserted in their flight by the mutineers, and then as we proceeded leisurely downhill to where the boats were lying, related in a few words what had taken place. It was a story that profoundly interested Silver, and Ben Gunn, the half-idiot maroon, was the hero from beginning to end. Ben, in his long, lonely wanderings about the island, had found the skeleton. 
It was he that had rifled it. He had found the treasure. He had dug it up. It was the half of his pickaxe that lay broken in the ex ex excavation. He had carried it on his back in many weary journeys, from the foot of the tall pine to a cave he had on the two-pointed hill at the northeast angle of the island, and there it had lain stored in a safety since two months before the arrival of the Hispaniola. I'm going to leave it off there, and um, thank you for watching. Um, if you liked the video, please subscribe. If you didn't, it's okay. Um, you can thumbs up or thumbs down. Please leave a comment, and we're almost at the end of Treasure Island. See you in the next one. Bye.